Fun. Hey. 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 Someone was excited. Well, good morning. <laughs> Welcome to The Rock, where Jesus will rock your socks off this morning. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it's just one of those mornings. Wonderful things are about to unfold for you. Just know that, okay? <laughs> God, we thank you this morning. Ah. I don't know why I keep hearing. We just need to take a deep breath, okay? So on the count of three, we're just going to breathe in real deep, and then we're just going to blow it out our mouths. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. That was great. <clears throat> What'd you guys bring? Stress? You guys sh stressing in here. That's all right. Today's the day that we're going to drive that away. So nervous for you. Maria. So nervous for Eugene. <laughs> so nervous. So nervous for Garrett, too. <laughs> if you guys are new here this morning, <laughs> let it be, let it be a, a warning label that the people you see in the morning on the stage don't have all the rocks left up on the brains. <laughs> I can't believe she said that about you. <laughs> Did you hear her? <laughs> I need to reverse. Wow. <laughs> it is okay. It's okay. It's okay. To have fun in church. It's okay to smile. Yeah. It's okay to laugh. Yeah. It's okay to make fun of each other. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Just filling all these things from you guys. It's going to be good today. It is. Did you guys come this morning with expectation? Did you? Yes. Every Sunday morning when you wake up, you should be like, yes. Wake up with a heart of expectation. And what that is is because you expect to go to church and you expect God to move, right? If you expect that, God's going to move in your hearts. He's going to move in your lives. We should go to church and gather together. Whenever two or three are gathered, he shows up. Like all of them. God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the whole thing. So every Sunday morning, we're gathering. And you should be expecting God to be here. Because he is. And he's good. And he is so ready to bless you today. And he's so ready to change your lives today. And he is so ready for some of you to finally give up what you've been trying all of this time. He's ready for you to just give it up. Say, let me. Let me today. So God, we raise up our arms to you. We raise up our lives to you in expectation. God, you have the atmosphere prepped. Holy Spirit, you are in the house this morning. So it's with great anticipation, God, that we totally turn this stage over to you. And let it be just an overflowing wave of the Spirit just knocking people over this morning. So that when we walk out of here, we walk out of here changed. We walk out of here touched. We walk out of here renewed. We walk out of here with our heads held high in understanding that God loves us no matter what we do yesterday, no matter where we were yesterday, that today is a new day, 
And God has called us to come together. And we thank you for that. Amen. If you guys want to stand up, we're going to get our worship on with evidence. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. And every season from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Come and fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. Promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. Because of you, oh Jesus. And I see the evidence of your goodness. Come on, sing it. All of my life. All of my life. I see your promises in fulfillment.
ever been so bothered by stuff in the middle of the night? Like you wake up and your heart is so heavy. Or you wake up and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can make it. Guys, whatever it is that's happening at night, that's fighting for your soul. Darkness loves to be in the dark, but when you carry God's light within you, you can wake up in the middle of the night and be like, wow, evil, nice try. Because you know what? I know who my father is, and I know the power that he has. And I know that he gave that power within me, within the spirit. That when you wake up, you're like, you know what? Bye-bye. In Jesus' name, you can go somewhere else. Because you know, and I know, who brings the day. And you know, and I know, who brings the power. And you know, and I know, that it's here today. Come on, we're going to sing this out. And I may not know what a day may bring, but I know. on the I'm glad you brought her today. She's excited. You know, Jesus says, come to me like a child because children know the heart of God. They're born with it. It's not until we get in this world and we get into things and, you know, we get, we get hurt, we get scarred, that as adults, we're afraid to come to the Father like a child. So if you ever want to see an example of, like, how we should worship God, just watch the kids. I mean, they just, they have that worship within them. And it's so awesome. And it's so amazing. <coughs> mm-hmm. All right. Well, welcome to The Rock. Pastor and um, Bethany are, are on vacation with their families today, and I know we prayed over them the first service just for, you know, safety and just to be, have a nice time of rest, because if you guys know Pastor, he cannot rest, and so just for him to be able to be totally present with his family in his vacation, um, because you know he's up at the crack of dawn talking to God along the beach and yeah oh, that would be so nice right now 
All right, I'm looking for the announcements. Here we go. All right, so May 20th. It says, come touch the community. So it's May Days, which I guess they told me first service was the old moon landing. If you guys are around this area, they used to do. Back when I was a kid, that was like, that was a fun thing. So it's called May Days now, and it'll be May 20th. Um, my assumption is they're taking rock walls and inflatables, and if you guys want to volunteer to go ahead, uh, reach out to Bethany or um, Pastor about that. So the next thing is we are having a special offering May 28th for the Vanegrift Community Church Plants. So May 28th. It's funny, this morning, like as I'm saying that, I'm thinking pocketbooks, right? Does anyone grew up that knew their grandma and they was like, go get me my pocketbook, right? Your purse. So make sure you bring your purses on the 28th. Make sure you empty out your car, you know, little cup holder if you want with change and, and sprinkle that into the community of Vandegrift because it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. And there's so many kids in Vandegrift. That's the next generation, you know, the kids, the next generation. So if you guys want to bless the next generation so that they have somewhere to go in all the brokenness that they have somewhere safe that they can go after schools and do rock climbing. Um, God only knows what's going to happen over there. It's going to be big and it's going to be awesome for that community. So if you want to bless that community, May 28th, bring your change, bring your wallets, bring your credit cards. You can always give online. You can go to yourrock.org and at the very bottom there is some kind of a blue symbol. It's the only one on the bottom right corner. Click it, and it'll take you to the giving site. And you can do that for regular offerings on Sundays. Um, I have an auto, so every Sunday it auto gives because I can't remember anything. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so that's easy. So that's something for you guys to do. So welcome to The Rock. If you're new, get some donuts and coffee after church. We have an awesome service this morning brought to you by Joe. Yeah, if you guys want to put your hands together for Joe. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Morning. I, uh, <clears throat> so either Pastor Terry needed a vacation that badly, or he trusts me, <laughs> you know, so, uh. I don't think I was actually properly vetted. I don't know. Um, he, uh, he's never heard me preach before. So with that being said, I've brought a bunch of Kool-Aid. And after service, you're not allowed to leave here until you drink a cup. You understand? Uh -oh. <laughs> but uh, God is good. God is faithful. And uh, it, it's been probably a year since I've started faithfully attending you all, and I still remember that day. And I remember standing here, there was a weird little man standing behind these keyboards. <laughs> it said, you belong here, on his shirt. And he sang the song, Do You See What I See? And I finally get a chance to. And this is what he does, he looks up here all the time. You notice this? We're going to turn our hearts to see the Lord today. And he's already active and he's already at work. And he's drawn you here. He's up to something. He is. And so I'm stepping out in faith here because I believe the Lord wants to share his story through me. So like any good story, we could start from the beginning. So we're going to start all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. And then we're going to read the whole Bible today. All right? So if you turn with your Bible to Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 
and then the stars and the oceans and the animals and the people and it was good right it was good so what happened what <laughs> no I, my daughter has an answer <laughs> what happened is uh, we're, we're in a mess now right and to be honest it's kind of it's been messy from the start because if you recall god created us and formed us from the dust, from the dirt, from the earth. Now, I don't know, my wife must have been made of something different. Sugar and spice and everything nice. But the rest of you all, dirt. Dirt. Wouldn't it be awesome if it was like lava? Wouldn't that be cool if I were made from lava? I'd be like, I love you, and God would say, yes, I love you too. No. But he made us from dirt, and no wonder everything kind of fell apart. Huh? I mean, Lord, you made us from dirt. What did he expect to happen? And the Lord said, watch me. You of little faith. And he was talking to me when he called me, thinking that I was not worthy. He said, watch me. Watch me. The name Joseph means increasing faithfulness. God said, I will show you my faithfulness through you. So let us pray. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us for thinking so highly of ourselves and so little of you. Help us not focus on the substances that we are made of, but let's see the hand that has formed us. May we rest in the palm of your hand and trust you that you made us to worship you. If our sole purpose is to worship you, then why do we question you? You made us for your glory, that our chief end, our end result, is made to glorify you forever. Forgive us for making it about me for making it about ourselves. Lord, we thank you that you breathed into us your life, your spirit. So you put yourself in my lungs, in our lungs, so that we can pour out our praise. You have placed your spirit in me so I could declare your glory. Thank you, Lord. Forgive us that we try to steal your glory. Forgive us, Lord. We turn your glory into shame. I praise you, Lord, for not casting me away from your presence. You did not take your Holy Spirit from me. Thank you, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon your people so we can praise him. So we can just praise him. And I just want to continue that heart of worship this morning. So if you know this little song, please sing it with me. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, and what we bring, may it be a sweet, sweet sound. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Thank you, Lord.
to share a lesson this morning that comes from uh, 2 Corinthians. You'll find it in chapter 4. Starting in verse 5. We do not preach about ourselves. The subject of all our sermons is Jesus, the anointed one. He is Lord and he is master of all. For Jesus, his sake, we are here to serve you. And the God who spoke light into existence, saying, let the light shine from darkness, is the very one who has set our hearts ablaze to shed light on the knowledge of the glory of God. Puts his light in you to glorify him. And reveal the face of Jesus. He has put this beautiful treasure. And it's contained in us. Cracked pots made of earth and clay. So that the transcendent character of this power will be clearly seen. As coming from God and not from us. We are cracked and chipped and affli- and from our afflictions from all over. But we are not crushed by them. We are bewildered at times, but we do not give in to despair. We are persecuted, but we have not been abandoned. We have been knocked down, but we have not been destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the reality of the brutal death and suffering of Jesus. And as a result, his resurrection, his resurrected life rises in us and reveals its wondrous power in us as well. Amen. Amen. So I would imagine there's many out there that seen the the chosen right yeah great great show i love the best part i think is just how they depicted all the characters but especially how they depicted jesus as someone with soul and heart and just wittiness and just funny just has this sense of humor and lightness to him that you just want to get around right and man do they capture it i mean wow and he has this sense of humor, and that stood out to me because I know, I know God has jokes. I know he's funny uh, because, man, he chooses people like me to serve him, people like you, people like Garrett. Huh? Man, God's got a sense of humor, right? He said, I'm going to use you for the glory of God, and uh, so look out. <laughs> and we're like... He's joking, right? He's got to be kidding me. Ah, but God wants to work in you. And uh, he has to have a sense of humor, right? It's ridiculous. But then we look back in history and we see in scriptures that there's a long-standing tale of God using broken, messed up people for his glory, for his purpose. And that hasn't changed, folks. He's still doing it. He's doing it in me. He's doing it in you. But we look back and at our examples, and we see all the people that loved God but failed horribly. We see Jacob, who was a liar. Gideon was a coward. Moses, a murderer. Aaron had a stutter. Rahab was a prostitute. Esther was an orphan. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Peter was hot-headed and arrogant. Paul. Paul made his living killing Christians. God still used him. Right? And you think he can't use you? But I know what's going on in your heart. You're thinking, yeah, but you don't know. You don't know what I've been up to. Well, it's not that I don't, I don't have to know. 
God already knows. He still wants to use you. He still wants to use you. And uh, look out. When you surrender, when you finally realize that it's not about you, it's what he's going to do through you. For his glory, step out of the way. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Because it ain't about you. God wants to do something. He uses crackpots. And I've brought this illustration because I love this gift. My, my children was, I think, the first thing they bought me for Christmas. You know, Santa's little workshop. Huh? And my daughter, look, she's all happy. And I loved this. I was like, oh. When I opened it, it was my favorite gift for Christmas. And it's just a mug that I love Batman because he's pretty cool. But Dad's Batman? My, my children think Dad is Batman. I just thought, oh, this is the greatest cup. I love this. It was my favorite gift. And then I smashed it. I was heartbroken. I'm like, ah. Oh. But I loved it so much, I glued it back together. And it's not perfect, but... It reminds me of the truth that in our brokenness, God's light shines through, through the cracks, through our weakness, through our brokenness. His light shines for the world to see. And now I love this cup even more. I think I'm going to get a chain and just rock it. Because, like, man, it's so special to me. Because God puts his light in our lives and shines through our brokenness. He shines through our brokenness. We don't have to be perfect. And when we think we are, we get in the way of what God wants to do. And I always do that. We always do that, don't we? We think it's about us or we think we have to you know, strive and, and, and put in work and be better and clean up our mess. And God said, no, I'm going to work right through there, right in the midst of your mess. Watch what I can do. So stop getting in the way. I still get in the way, and I do it all the time, but I realize that his power perfects us. It makes our weakness strong. It makes our weakness strong because it's through his strength, through his power, not by might, by my power, or my spirit, says the Lord, not in your strength. So we can't rely on ourselves. We have to let that go. There's nothing good comes from us. If, if you've been blessed by anyone here, know that you were blessed by God, not by Joe, not by Garrett, not by Maria. I know we got a great worship team, but they're just a band of misfits, right? They're just bringing glory to God and blessed because of the God in them, by the God in us. Don't look at who is in front of you. See the God that's in there. that He's put his light into our hearts and has set it ablaze. Love that translation. He set it ablaze. In the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, we see he's talking about there's two types of vessels that you find in the house. Those of gold and silver and then those of wood and clay. Some for honorable use and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel of honor and set apart as holy and useful to the master and ready for every good work. And I know some of us read that and say, well, that means I just got to clean myself up. No, God makes you holy. It's his work. Don't get it mixed up. He makes you honorable. So he can use you. Get out of the way. He wants to make you a vessel of honor. 
to be used for his purpose. And I know we're a bunch of blockheads here still, made of clay and dirt, wood, and stone. God can use those things. Bring him glory. And he has set an example for us to allow him to work through us. And Jesus said it this way, that those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted, yes. And it's through humility. The power of humility, glorious humility, that God is able to make us vessels of honor. Set apart as holy for his good work. And that's how I got to be here today. Because it's been a long process of humiliation in my life. And it continues to be. It's hard to be humble. It is hard to be humble. But God worked in me. And through humiliation, through that process, helped me realize who I am as a child of God. You see, I was raised in a God-fearing home and early on had instilled in me good Christian values and worldviews and as far back as I can remember. And I was baptized early on and confessed the faith and I had all the means of which I needed to grow into the blessings and promises of Jesus Christ. I had it all. I had parents who exemplified what it means to live out our faith. And by the glory of God, exemplified what it means to be broken and still glorify God. And now that I'm a parent, I see that too. That in our brokenness, we can still show our children the way. Yet, even though I had this good upbringing, and I had at my disposal disposal, the riches of his glorious inheritance, I turned my back on God. I turned my back on the way that my parents have shown me, and like many who fall away, I decided to do this on my own, go my own direction. I didn't care about the impact that would have on my family. Nor did I realize what I was giving up. The wealth, the riches available to me as God's child. I thought there was a better way. That this world had something more to offer. Man, I was wrong. It was humiliating to find that out. That was the first step of what brought me low before the cross of God. Now, psychologists say that every choice we make is to limit pain or enhance pleasure. And for the most part, this is true, I think. Our choices are usually a matter of convenience. Especially when we're living by the world's standards and upholding the values of the world in our life. And that's what I did. I went after every pleasure I desired, everything that came across my path, I indulged in. And eventually, you end up what's called searing your conscience. Because even though I knew better, I kept chasing those things and indulging in them, and then I didn't see the difference anymore. You become numb to it. Eventually, you stop hearing that pesky voice on your shoulder that tells you, Joe, you shouldn't be doing that. It reminds you, there's that conscience that tells you right and wrong, and you can avoid that and sear it, and you can't hear it anymore if you 
keep ignoring it. And that's what happened to me, and that was the next phase of my humiliation, that I was no longer able to tell right from wrong. And I chased every desire to, especially in the area of drugs and alcohol, to the point of insanity. And I did so without guilt, without hesitation. And all the choices that I made turned me into something I could no longer recognize. You become what your thoughts, what you think. I think, therefore, I am. Well, my thoughts had left me deaf, dumb, and blind. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was heading. I was so far out there, I wasn't even sure who I was anymore. I was lost in space and out in orbit somewhere like, oh, what's wrong with that guy? He's a little bit, oof. I was out there. I even, you know, I got a nickname eventually, uh, Satellite, because I was just whew, orbiting out there in space, you know, because of the choices I made. I'm still a little crazy, and I think that's okay, right? Is that okay? You know, you got <laughs> God can't use you unless you're a little bit nuts, right? Amen? You know, and that's why God uses uh, Pastor Terry so well, right? Uh, I mean, God bless him. So there I was, just another uh, teen lost in America. There's so many of us, huh? And uh, sure, I managed to, to graduate high school and maintain a job, and I even made it through two years of college. But you can't keep living that way and, and expect things to work out. It just doesn't work. Especially when you've got a mother praying for you. How many here have a mother praying for them? Huh? God, pray for your children. You don't know what they're up to. But thank God that I had a mother praying for me. Because God knows what I was up to. She was praying that her prodigal son would return to his heavenly father. And I was, you know, I spared you from all the details, but I got involved heavy in drugs and became a drug dealer eventually. And I found out it's hard to retire as a drug dealer, right? You, uh, you don't have a 401k or a benefits package, you know. You're pretty much got nothing. You got some money and some drugs. That's about it. And then you're surrounded by a bunch of people who want to take those things. So it's not usually a good way to, you know, set up retirement. But, uh, you know, then you surround, like, you surround yourself by people who you think care about you. Oh, these are my boys, right? They don't care. They just want what you have to offer. Bad character is the result of bad company. And sure, I could say maybe I surrounded myself by bad people. But eventually, I was the bad person. And I was the one corrupting those people that came into my life. You know, I, uh, I can't believe, you know, as I was preparing this morning, that it's already been 22 years since God grabbed me by the scruff of my neck. But he's still doing that, just in different ways. There's levels to this thing called Christianity. And God has always got to get a hold of us and push us to the new level. And 22 years ago, my stupid choices got the best of me. I made a deal with a fellow criminal, and I saw this opportunity to get, and he saw his opportunity, actually, to get over on me. 
And what I hoped was this awesome deal that would make me a kingdom of fools got me arrested. I was given a list of charges and strip searched and thrown in the county jail. And there I was. I thought I was so free, living such a fun life. But that freedom had become a yoke of slavery. And for out of my own free will, I was landed behind bars. And there I was, feeling betrayed by these so-called friends. I was left alone and degraded. I just had my thoughts to keep me company. And I thank God I had a foundation still as a child. Because my thoughts went back. It's so important to teach your children. Because it comes back. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. It comes back. But it was humiliating to be in that position and have nothing. I thought I was doing okay and having a good life, and I was stripped of it all, taken away. And I had many chances along the way to correct my errors, to turn around. And God gives us chance after chance, does he? doesn't he? He knocks on our door, on our heart. But I kept ignoring it. You see, when you're living in sin, you'll find that God's mercies continue to chase after you. To try to turn you from what you're doing. But if you continue to be in disobedience, it gets harder. Not only harder to see those opportunities, but harder to accept them. But the good news is that there's always hope. There is always hope. No matter who, no matter what, please hear me when I say that you cannot be so far off that you exhaust the reach of God's grace. No matter how bad your choices or mistakes are, no matter how big the consequences are, Jesus has already forgiven you and wants to restore you. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is surrender to trust, to believe. For the wells of grace do not run dry matter where you are in life. And I am living proof of that. Not just that day 22 years ago, but each and every day. I put God's mercy to the test. And I've proven him strong each and every time. See, my problem was that I was trying to live for myself. God had a plan for me, but I didn't want it. Maybe another time I'll tell you about that, but we don't have time for that. But it becomes, you know, if when God has a plan and you ignore it, and you start trying to shape and form your own plan in your life, it gets harder and harder to accept God's plan for you because it takes a change. A conversion has to take place for you to accept God's will. And you're not ready for it. You become stubborn. But as much as it would eventually hurt to give in to God, because there, there is a surrender, and it hurts. It hurts, let me warn you. But eventually, as you continue down that path, It's painful to remain the same in your sin, dead. And I had reached the point where it was more painful to remain in my sin than it was to surrender. I didn't have to get to that point. 
but I'm stubborn, right? The price I was willing to pay in order to change was finally worth the cost. I was arrogant, I was stubborn, yet even I knew I had enough. And I realized that all my efforts were in vain, in a striving after the wind. I had worked so hard to live for myself and fill my, fulfill my every desire, but I had nothing to show for it. And there I was in this jail cell, and I had reached the peak of my humiliation. I realized I was a fraud. I was broken. I was afraid. Stripped of all my dignity, all of my pride. And all that was left there was a scared little boy. I had reached the all-time low, the furthest point of my humiliation. But if I had not gone there, I would have never reached God's glory. The next step that was coming, I would have never seen it. I praise God for that, for this next step that happened. Because there's a funny truth that happens when you hit your rock bottom. Is that the only place to go from there is up. Amen? And it was then that I finally decided... The, and solve that the one thing I must do is the one thing we all must do is to stop looking to ourselves. Stop looking to other people and other things in our life and whatever this world has to offer and start looking to the one who created you, who called you according to his purpose. To surrender to him. The only one who is able and fit to direct your life. And I was humiliated in the fullest sense of the term. And uh, we never really got a chance to define it, so we're going to take the time to do that now. And Wikipedia says that humiliation is the abasement of pride, which creates mortification and leads to a state of being humbled or reduced to a lowliness or to submission. So in other words, it's when a person is stripped of all their pride, any sense of self-worth, significance in yourself is removed. And they are ready to give up the fight and surrender their will to hopefully the powers that be our Lord. And all the humiliation I endured was for one thing, to force me to stop looking inward to myself and stop looking to other people to fulfill my life and start looking upward and outward to God. To realize that I don't have the strength I need to save myself, nor does anyone or anything else. It forced me to no longer rely on my own instincts and my own understanding but to trust the Lord and in all my ways acknowledge him. And by admitting to him my faults and my weaknesses, his power has been perfected in me. That's what happens. I was given a clean slate. My records were expunged both literally and spiritually. Both on heaven and on earth. A new life had come and was given to me. And I realized that not only is our Lord my Redeemer, but He is the lover of my soul. He cares deeply for me. And in that realization, I surrendered. And a change begins to take place. He bursts His Spirit within you, and you surrender to God's love. But it's through humility that that process happens. It takes your pride and crushes it so that he can begin to work in you. Andrew Murray, an a old pastor from the 1800s, said this about humility. He said, our humiliation leads us in the experience of the presence and power 
of Jesus. To choose humility is our highest blessing. It is through humility that we experience the presence and power of Jesus. And once Jesus, once you actually experience this and actually see the humility of Christ and his loving acts of grace on the cross towards us, it humbles you. True humility leads us to a fascination, a wonder of worship to God. Through realizing what God has done for us, was willing to endure. The only response is praise. So I shared this story for one purpose. To show you that it's really not about me. It never really was. You don't have to look about at my life and my story to know that God loves you. He wants to touch your life. He doesn't care about what you're involved in, but wants to work inside that situation for his glory. It's not my humility that matters, but it's his humility. The humility of Christ, and we read about that in Philippians chapter 2. Where it says that though he was God, Jesus did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took on a humble position as a slave. And was born as a human, and he appeared in human form, and he humbled himself in obedience to God. And he died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at that name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord the glory of God the Father. It's Christ's humility. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. And we see that Jesus, even Jesus, went through that process. And that's the model that we have as our example as Christians. To live a life abandoned to God in obedience to the point of death, if it takes us there, even death on a cross. To live a life worthy of the calling you have received requires that you too are crucified. Christ commands us to pick up their cross. To pick up your cross and follow me. Sometimes, as Christians, we forget to do that. We rely on our own strength. But humiliation becomes that lesson once again. We must come to Jesus in humility to surrender our will, our lives to him each day. A summary, a summary once given about Christ's passion reveals his glorious humiliation. But in Christ, we see that Christ's closest friends humiliated him by deserting him and by betrayal. And the religious leaders humiliated him by spitting in his face and falsely accusing him. And the political leaders humiliated him by scourging and offering to trade his life for a known criminal, Barabbas. The soldiers humiliated him 
by crowning his head with thorns and mocking his kingship. And his executors humiliated him by stripping him naked and nailing above him on the cross the sign reading, This is your king, the king of the Jews. Humiliation that Christ suffered is hard enough to think of as going through it as a man. But enduring it as almighty God? I mean, I can't understand that. But what about God's divine humility? That he was willing to surrender his throne, his kingdom, and enter into our mess because of his love for you. What but divine humility could do such a thing? The God of this universe asks us to pick up our cross and follow him. We are not in position to negotiate the terms. Sure, he offers us riches untold, and, but he asked us to pick up our cross. So first, we must bear the cross. And in order to pick up that cross, whatever it is you're holding on to, whatever you're trusting in, you have to let it go. You can't pick up the cross with something in your hand. You can't surrender to God without giving up what you're putting your faith in. Pick up your cross and follow him is the call to all of us this day. You know, my brokenness is always before me. It's nothing new. But when I am weak, he is strong. When I am willing to surrender, when I'm willing to say, you know what, I was trusting in myself. I was trusting in my understanding, in my knowledge, in my degrees, in my, you know, my money, in my power. I was trusting in these things, and God said, you can't hold me if you're holding that. You can't hold me. You can't hold the cross. You can't pick it up. When there's other things competing for that. God wants to shine his light through your cracks. He wants to put his light in you. And through your brokenness, he will show his son. He will show the world what he can do a broken pot, a broken vessel. It's an amazing thing. And we get to participate in that if we simply surrender. It's all, it's so, it's like simple. And we learn about this in, in Sunday school, right? This little light of mine. It's, it's, it's this little light, and it's not a little light. I mean, I have this spotlight, but it's God's light. It wants to shine in you to the world. That's an amazing thing. And it's so simple. And we forget it and we mess it up. So I just want to, we're going to move into a time of prayer. And I uh, want to start off by praying what that first verse says that we read this morning in 2 Corinthians. God wants to put his light in your heart and set it ablaze. He wants to put his fire in you. And through that, through your brokenness, the world will see it. The world will see God through your brokenness. Do you believe that? And get out of the way. Get out of the way. It's not about you. It's what God is doing through you. In all areas of your life. In all areas of your life. I know 
Pastor Terry, God bless him. He's, he's an amazing man, and he serves the Lord, and we love him. But I think we can look at him and his charisma and say, well, I can't do the things he's done. I can't serve the Lord like that. Well, Terry will be the first one to tell you, yes, you can, because it's not me. It's not me. It's what God does through me. And every time I think it's me, I screw it up. And I'm telling you that again. And you know your heart right now is telling you the same thing. So let's move into a time of prayer. Uh, Maria is going to just bless us with a, a song of intercession. That God wants to pray and change your life. And we're going to have people here praying if you want a specific prayer. But God wants to set your heart ablaze. He wants to shine his light in your brokenness but he's asking you to surrender, to humble yourself so that he can lift you up. Amen. Thank you. So this song, it's new. Good job, Joe. <laughs> it's called In Jesus' Name. And it is a song, it's a prayer, sung as interceding. And in a world where people are saying, I'm praying for you, is replaced with, you're in my thoughts. Or when people are going through something and they're like, just send me good vibes. Just send good vibes my way. I see that a lot on social media. And it, it always just hit me the wrong way. And it's because my thoughts will do nothing for you. My sending good vibes towards you does nothing. I have no power. It is whenever I give myself to Jesus and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit that whenever you're going through something, I can look at you and I can start praying over you and over your life in Jesus' name. Jesus is the power. Jesus is what changes your life, not me. Jesus is the one who can send his spirit. So as we sing this in Jesus' name, I'm gonna ask, I know we got prayer, some prayer warriors up in this place. If that is you, I'm gonna ask that you're able to kind of set front or in the back or in the side. Guys, if you need prayer today, go find yourself one of these prayer warriors and they're gonna pray over your life in Jesus' name with not good vibes, with not their thoughts, with God's power that he has given us through his spirit Today is the day. Whatever you brought in here, we're going to get rid of that. Okay? So as we sing this song, if you're feeling, if you've been walking some certain way, if you've been talking a certain way, if things have just been hard, you know God's pulling at your heart right now. And it's not because I'm saying it. It's because God is doing it. If that is you, find one of these prayer warriors and we're just going to start kicking the devil in the face this morning <laughs> here we go I speak the name of Jesus 
Jesus. 
pray that the fear of inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. Thank you. 